Welcome you beautiful faces back to Pommy and Oz. Hope we're all doing really well. If you're new around here, hit that like button and that subscribe. Really, really helps the channel out. You've really shown a lot of support recently. Uh, I'm in my uh, stay-at-home mom vibe with the turtleneck because that's how cold it is. So if you want to drop a like, drop a subscribe, that would really help. Just let me know you're enjoying the content and get the comments going because I do try and reply to every comment. I'm pretty good, even the mean ones. I have a little bit of a pop, so... We're here today to talk about a very interesting stat that everyone has brought to my attention. Cow and currently 15th, so fourth worst defence in the league, and that's just points against. Now, when you actually look at that metric, that's a very factual statement, it is. And I figured, let's get into it and let's get into the real nuts and bolts of it and go, all right, but what does that mean, sir? So, so here you are. Let's stack us against the best side in the league. And I think I've earmarked where our issue is. So David King did a wonderful report today about stoppage. And that's something that I've been saying that we, we look to break even in there. And if you actually look at the difference between average points against Cowan at 87, Sydney, top of the ladder, 71.8. And it's really important to know if you watch the um, fluid champion scale that we did. Cowton rank well in the range of winning the Premiership in all the metrics. Scores from turnover, turnover defence with the best side in the league. Scores from defensive half, defensive half defence. All of that is good. The one that doesn't stack up is the stoppage against. Currently 41.8 versus the best stoppage defending side in the league. And although Cowton do very well at scoring, it's the defence from that avenue. And you can see here that the difference per game is almost the same. It's a point difference. So I think that the big issue with Cowton's defence isn't the defence. It's their ability to defend from mid forward. The defence stats really are positive. They rank very high. They're the best side one-on-one -on -one defensively. They have one of the best rebound rates. They have one of the best... Um, one of the lowest expected scores from easy shots. What that means is count and give up inside 50s genuinely from low scoring positions. It's genuinely this area here because this area here is where count and can't zone as effectively because they're outnumbered in these areas. It's very easy to manipulate from stoppage. And this is where count were really strong from scoring. And this is how they get their quick one outs and things from stoppage, hence their big scores. So that would indicate there that it's a setup and makeup issue and a personnel issue. So then you're looking at your on ballers, and there's that big debate, isn't there? Mark Pitnett and TDK, TDK on his own, Mark Pitnett on his own, George Kennedy, all that malarkey. So what we did is we went right back and we got just Voss's makeups, and we've done it based here, here. On a fairness scale. So what we've done here is I don't want players who have played ones. They've got to have played more than twice for this. And also, we don't want the ones where we didn't have Ruckman and Lewis Young was Ruck. Because that's just stupid. We ain't going to do that. So what we've done here is we've earmarked stoppage as a problem. So going back to my golf days, what you do is... This is why I'm heavily onto data. When you ask a golfer why they're shit, I'm going to give you an example, right? Let's say they were knocking the ball in their approach shot on average 12 foot, right? And let's say that they held every putt. They averaged 1.4 putts for 18 holes. And let's say they finished four under par. They would tell you that they're playing really well, right? Now, another example would be, let's say their average distance from the hole in their approach shots was 18, right? And they were 1.7 putts per hole. But they scored, say, two under par. And then let's say the same stats were there, but you doubled the putts. They would tell you they didn't put well if they were four over par. But the truth be told, when you looked at the actual nuts and bolts of their stats, they weren't getting the ball close enough to the hole. And it's amazing how, as a player myself, until I saw the data, I would always be re results-based analysis, not process-based analysis. So what we're trying to do here is with process-based analysis, Cowton need to improve 15 points to get, at least to be top of the ladder defensively, all in all points against. 
But 16 points per game are conceded from stoppage, which puts us, like we say, second worst in the league and fourth worst defence. So this is what we're looking at here. We've earmarked stoppage through our process-based analysis. And what you'll see here, these initials are players. So I'm not going to patronise you. I think you can work it out. We've scored it from different differential, which is important. So what we're looking for is we're looking for something 10 and above because we don't have to be top of that ladder. That is the aim. We want to be in the top six because that is, if you remember the Premiership DNA, top six is king, right? Okay, so the first one, the best differential, the hardest side to score against as well, incidentally, is ba -ba -ba -ba, George Hewitt, PC, Patrick Cripps, MP, Mark Pernet, and TDK. So you can see a dual Ruckman, right? Now, the big difference here is turnover scores are almost half what second is, right? And there's another issue. There is an SW, Sam Walsh. So we've got to disregard this from our process-based analysis because it's madness to have Sam Walsh out of the side. I think we'd all agree with that. Sam Walsh is one of the first five players mentioned. So we look at this and we go, okay, stoppage is good. Stoppage against is good. Now, why is stoppage against maybe a concern if you've watched all the videos of what we do? The big change off, and this is a lot from last year we saw this formation, was we were very stoppage based and our turnover and defensive half was very poor. So we don't want to be so prudent from stoppage at the risk of setting up to really win this area and not have scores around the back. So this would then make us look at the next best. George Hewitt, Matt Kennedy, Patrick Cripps, Sam Walsh, TD Gay. Ticks the Sam Walsh box. More scores from stoppage. More against, but 11.5, that magical number. So this one here is instantly appealing to us. The other ones here, you've got Adam Chera, George Hewitt, Matt Kennedy, Patrick Cripps, Mark Pernet, and Sam Walsh. We play them all, right? Decent scores, a little bit less against, but only an 8.2. So I want you to keep in mind there that you can do it. Now, what would the issue be playing with two rooks? We've got to look at that. Obviously, Adam Cher is in, which is a positive, and I do think he's best 22. And my synopsis will show that. So stay with me while we digest this together. Obviously, playing two rooks right, means that we're going to have to play one less player in the forward half. Now, is that a problem? Probably, because traditionally when we play two rugs, our tackles in the forward half are less because we're having to deploy someone to pinch it in the midfield. The last week, you saw Lockie Foggy the week before because we changed our makeup slightly and everyone complained about the ruining, with Matt Cottrell coming in, ruining that DNA. We had one less on baller, so we stole it from the forward line, which dropped our pressure in the forward line. So this is maybe a yellow tick where it ticks all the boxes. And then next, these are the ones that are really negligible and you're breaking even. Adam Chera, George Hewitt, um, Patrick Cripps, Mark Pittenet and TDK. Again, 4.7. You can see a pattern here. When Mark Pittenet plays, stoppage scores don't massively increase without TDK. So it's a real interesting little facet here. And the turnover scores, as we proved in a video a couple of weeks ago, don't dramatically change. But you can see here, this area here obviously affects the fluidity of that midfielder. And it's all about balance, remember. We're trying to do a balance. So, right, let's say we're going to focus on the second one because I think we can all agree, right? So let's have a look at that. And we can see here that the on-ball crew, statistically to keep our balance, is... Patrick Cripps, TDK, Matt Kennedy, Sam Walsh, George Hewitt. Now, there is a noticeable exception here. We've lost Adam Chera, but don't worry, right? Don't worry. Chesney, we're going to look after him. But his average stoppage for 46.8. So let's just say that that was our average scores all year, right, from stoppage, right? So that is a good little point to start off. Currently, Carlton ranked the third best side in the league from stoppage. Only the Doggies, Sydney, are better than us. And it's 0.7 from Sydney and it's 1.5 away. So it's, we're not really asking for a lot. But that would put Carlton first. Now, the important one is the against. If Carlton were playing this all the time, based on what we know, right, Carlton currently are the second most scored against side in the league. 
If we switch to this, we are looking at a big, big drop. We are looking at a big drop, which is what we want to do. And at 35.3 would take us around the AFL average. It would take us into, instead of the second easiest, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh easiest to score. So it's still not huge, but this is where you always look at the numbers. Really, really important when you look at it. Currently, Carlton, right, are 13th differential. If we changed to this makeup, because you want to look at the differential, that is so important. The differential there is what? Plus 11.5. Plus 11.5. Currently, our differential, right, is 0 0.27. This would put a second best differential in the league, just in between Sydney and the Dogs. So that's why when you look at total averages, they're really flawed. You want to look at the differential because what the differential tells you is how they work together. They're a symbiotic relationship. So the scores from turnover don't change massively. So currently, when we talked about Carlton, and we were always bigging up our turnover game, currently Carlton from turnover are second with 56.4. It's not a big difference, right? So you see, it really suits the myriad of the game style already. We don't want to do something that is big. Carlton currently have the second best defence in the league with only 41 points scored against. This would slightly change. Obviously, we've got a smaller catchment, but you can see it still makes the same myriad that we basically rank the same places we do with this makeup. But... This presents that next problem. Adam Chera, how does he fit in here? So then we've got to look at what Carlton are doing and what Voss is doing. You've seen the Arazio role. You've seen the Cottrell role. Why is that? Why does he want someone pitting, chitting in there, right? Why does Carlton roll one winger back to play at halfback to allow the overlap run? It's all symbiotic. They want a point of difference. Now, let's look at good teams, Sydney. Errol Goulden is a real fascinating creature because he plays very advanced, but he swings out onto the wing and then pinches in the ball. They protect him. They also flow players. So you saw Callum Mills do that this week. Isaac Heaney in the ball, half forward, up the wing. Every team has this like sixth player that goes on the ball and six and seven. Usually it's a half fold, but you can see Carlton want this point of difference. This loose player that the doggies played very effectively against Carlton around stoppage. And we're trying to find that. Now, when Carlton traditionally play, they're really reluctant at times to try and pull a midfielder into that position, right? But I think I've found it. Adam Chera. Now, we look here at the top one. This is an average game when he was at Freer, right? I want you to look at the heat map. So, he roughly played throughout his career. We disregard the first year when he was a baby. But it's around 48% defensive mid, 22 on the ball, and the rest floating at half forward, right? And you look at Carlton, we've played him predominantly this year as an on-baller. Now, this really affects Sam Walsh. Now, there was a very interesting case with Steven Gerrard and Frank Lampard talking soccer in the UK where they played the identical job and they could never play together. So what you've got to do there is you've got to look at other roles that they can fulfil. And I think that if you look at Gerrard, what are his skill sets? His ability out of traffic is very good. His ability to be a metronome. We're trying to change because Sam Doherty last year, and if we look at this with two players, Nick Newman's been real heralded for his form and his overlap run. But you look at Ollie Holland, pinches down to the back and then plays a little bit in and around the ball at half forward. He feels like the surplus player, particularly since Matt Cottrell's come in. It's really affected his heat map when he rests. So suddenly this makes sense that Ollie Hollands is almost playing that pseudo role we saw Sam Doherty play last year. It, it probably is Adam Chera. And I looked at this and I thought, and I'm only spitballing here. I'm not saying that this is the plan, but it really makes sense of how you could throw him in. Adam Chera's got great endurance, often runs that 13.8, 14Ks. Ollie Hollands is around that 14.8K. We're not playing him full-time on the wing, though. We're pinch-hitting him. What this would allow 
Is Nick Newman to play more advanced? Chera is incredibly good defensively, and we're going to talk on that stats. Also, what it would allow is when there is a tag of Walsh, you do what they do with Chad Warner. We saw Chad Warner when he was heavily tagged the last couple of weeks, swings up to the wing, swings up to half forward. They get him away from it, which then brings Adam Chera onto the ball. Also, when you're playing Alex Pomcar, very important to note that he's going to be taking a danger man. So effectively, you're already a midfielder down by playing a stopping role. So suddenly, you've opened up the door to have Adam Chera playing that burst role. Carlton really, when they're playing one, you look at our high stoppage scores, the amount of times Adam Saad and Nick Newman are involved in the offload, suddenly that's Adam Chera. And suddenly then you've got Cowan locking down, Nick Newman can swing back and lock down. You've also got that wonderful little poise there of what we always hope Zach Williams to be in the injury of Sam Doherty. And this is a real interesting little facet. I think I found it out. So let's have a look at if they played their roles, right? There's Oliver, there's Adam, and you can see that this year, with their disposals, it's been a very similar thing, right? So it's a very similar thing. So that stat there is wrong. Do forgive me. The average disposals this year are very, 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 very telling. Obviously, 21.2 for Adam Chera, and Ollie Hollands has a lot less. Ollie Hollands has 12.6. So ignore that first stat. The rest are right. I've just checked there. But that is really important to know that obviously one's playing on the ball, right? One is playing on the ball. Let's not too worry about that much. But then this is interesting. The 7.3 and the 11.4 kicks. Obviously, that's with the flux of having more ball. And the 60.2 kicking efficiency, 70.1. Now, that would be your first part of call, what's wrong with this plan. However, I can fix that. The contested possessions between these two players are really, really different, right? And when you look at the contested possession rate, you're looking at 5.9, right? You're looking at you're looking at a lot higher amount. So what you're looking at when you're looking at Adam Chera is he's almost 40% contested. So that really, really, really makes that big difference that obviously he's kicking in a lot more dangerous positions. He's obviously got the world against him. It's half that for Ollie Hollands, 25.1. So obviously what that says is that when they're in open space, Obviously, Adam Chera will be around the same thing. Now, the big thing with Ollie Hollands is the pressure axe. We always talk about the pressure axe. That's a very key component of what he's doing. He's two-way running. Advantage, Adam Chera. And you look at the rebound 50s, very similar minutes down behind the ball, incidentally, the same rebound 50s. But this is where you'll see the improvement from Adam Chera. Bigger body, more tackles, meters gained. Very similar, and that's quite impressive for Adam Chera, considering he's had so much inside mid-time, right? He doesn't often blaze the ball away. He's looking to use it. You can see disposals per unforced error, almost the same. But you look at the score involvement. So this is here saying that we could play him in that more looser role down back and be that little conduit. And suddenly this helps because then you've got Kennedy and Hewitt who are very mobile. It's, it's interesting that people forget these guys are very mobile. They, they're deceptively mobile, but so strong defensively. And what they're trying to do with Adam Chera is they're utilising his strong defence. If you watch the ratings, we always talk about how good Adam Chera is defensively. This week, he really shone with his defence and his pressure acts. But it's also his offence. But Matt Kennedy has added that layer to his game. And suddenly you've got a really, really versatile on-ball crew. Because if you add players like Elijah, who are going to pinch it in the ball, suddenly you've got eight players that can play in and around the ball. And this is where Adam Chera feels the odd one out at the moment when he's on the ball. Because it's kind of wasted playing him as a pseudo-Hewitt when you've got Kennedy and Hewitt. So this is a really interesting. So that's my synopsis of where it's going wrong. Yes, the defence is 15th for points against, but it's 17 from stoppage against, and that margin is identical. So is it something like this, a slight tactical change and play Adam Chera as that Sam Doherty, as we know? It seems to be an important role, and Foss has kind of alluded that we're trying to play Orazio Fantasia, now Matt Cottrell there. Is it as simple as switching Matt Cottrell to the wing full-time? Nick Newman and Chera play that role, and suddenly you find 30% on the ball time and get Chera out in space. It's very successful in the league this year. Nick Dacos obviously being the leader of that halfback flanker who pinch hits in the mid. 
Could be a little subtle change for the Blues to add a bit of dynamicness, particularly from the back half of the ground under pressure. And Adam Chera has proven he's very strong under pressure. And obviously the pressure in the forward defence is a little bit different than on the ball. It's a lot easier if you can master inside mid. Going back to maybe floating there is there. Very interesting little case. Let me know what you think in the comments. Peace, love and light. Palm out. Rolling up over black Cadillac High heel boots and a sexy body full of tats Baby's bad, oh baby's having